Hi, I'm Shri. You've seen my face a couple of times by now on this channel. Let me know if you can see me, if you can hear me. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to see the chat. <laughs> and the usual ad popped up in the way. Okay, I seem to be both visible and possibly audible. If you can hear me, let me know. Let me know if you can't hear me also. Um, and we will get started because we have an entire lesson that we want to get done today. usual thing that we generally start class with when do we meet we meet 3 to 4 pm mondays wednesdays fridays for grade 12 portions and tuesdays thursdays and saturdays for grade 11 portions today we are going to be doing grade 11 because it is if i'm not terribly wrong a thursday um and what we're going to be doing today is discovering to it the saga continues by a.r williams I am going to be honest with you, this chapter is not one in which we can stop and speak a lot about themes and a lot of ideas because it's a, it's a bit of a straightforward article. Um, this is actually an article that's been published in the National Geographic magazine back like years and years and years ago. And it's been written by A.R. Williams who actually writes quite a couple of articles for National Geographic. and. Um, He's actually also written like a series of articles about King Tut. Um, King Tut is an Egyptian pharaoh and he is the subject of the article that we're going to read together today. So, you know, when the title of the article says the saga continues, um, it really means that the epic continues, right? The epic of King Tut, this long ongoing story and so it's actually referring to the fact that A.R. Williams has written a bunch of articles about Tut and there's all this limited information that the world has about Tut so far and now we're going to continue learning more about Tut through whatever happens in the moment that the article depicts. So because it's an article, again, it's written in a very informative way. It's going to give us a lot of details about what happened that particular day and the events of the day. So again, we'll try to discuss as many ideas as we can from it, but there might not be too much to discuss. Uh, what we're going to be doing, as usual, is reading through the lesson, understanding the lesson, stopping every now and then to think about things. Uh, if you have any questions for me in the middle, please drop them in the chat. I check the chat here and there, and I will reply to questions about the lesson as we keep carrying on. Um, I should also let you know that I teach in English because I don't know Hindi. So again, if anything's unclear about the things that I'm saying, maybe, or you want me to just like slow down because some people have asked me to slow down sometimes, then let me know and I can do that as well. Having said all of that, I'm going to take a look at the chat. Um, hello to Jagreet and Mausam. Is that how I say your name? That's, that's a very pretty name. Um, okay, so we will go on with the lesson. So in the very beginning, A.R. Williams gives us this kind of introduction to it in this paragraph. He was just a teenager when he died. So really good starting line because that's a very unexpected piece of information for us to get. He was just a teenager when he died. It's a shocking thing. Most people don't expect people to die when they're teenagers. So, very effective impact from the beginning. The last heir of a powerful family that had ruled Egypt and its empire for centuries. 
so he is the beginning of an entire i mean sorry he is the ending of an entire dynasty that's been ruling egypt for years and years and years he was laid to rest laden with gold and eventually forgotten so when he dies it has been put in the tomb and he's been covered with gold um why has he been covered with gold we'll talk about that and he was forgotten because the rest of the world moved on past it and time went on and people probably forgot that he even existed um since the discovery of his tomb in 1922 the modern world has speculated about what happened to him with murder being the most extreme possibility so all the way as recent as 1922 um is when tut's tomb was found again here the discovery just means that archaeologists have gone and found it again and ever since we found out that this tomb exists and he is a person and that he died so young everyone's always been thinking about what happened to him and what reason he could have could have caused him to die so young and one of the most exciting theories or extreme theories that exist out there is that he may have been murdered and that's why he died so young now leaving his tomb for the first time in almost 80 years tut has undergone a ct scan that offers new clues about his life and death so tut uh, or the corpse of tut the mummy of tut has uh, been taken out of the tomb and it has been run through a ct scan so that they can analyze the mummy um the way that the sentence is phrased is very interesting uh because it sounds almost as though tut has like chosen to get up and walk out of the tomb and walk to a ct scan center and get a ct scan done the author has done that deliberately to um give some sort of life to do it in this moment um and this ct scan is giving us clues about his life and death which is to say it's going to tell us things about his body and perhaps tell us what caused him to die um and also tell us what he was like when he was alive right because um the body has evidences of uh, that analyzing body can tell you what sort of a life a person has led and also tell you how they died or how their life came to end and provides precise data for an accurate forensic reconstruction of the boyish pharaoh a pharaoh is a king uh, it's a title it sort of means king and he's called a boyish pharaoh because he was a very young person when he became a pharaoh and he died young too uh and the author wants to tell us in this line that this ct scan is going to help us reconstruct remake tut for us as he used to be and because it's a ct scan and you get a lot of extremely detailed images when you ct scan something you can reconstruct him better so we'll know better how he even looked for instance hello to ms khan one thing that we get immediately from this particular passage is that this article is going to be about history but it's also going to be about the present because tut has undergone a ct scan which is very modern technology right it's very new um it's something that all of us were used to but it's still something that's a relatively recent development when it comes to science and medicine and so there's this juxtaposition of that kind of history with this kind of very advanced modern technology and both of thing, those things come together in this first paragraph and it's a good indication of how the rest of the article is going to go and how we're going to have a mix of history and science and we're going to have a mix of the past and the present so that's kind of how it sets a good tone for the rest of the article an angry wind stirred up ghostly dust devils as king tut was taken from his resting place in the ancient egyptian cemetery known as the valley of the kings so the setting of this moment is in the valley of the kings um it's actually a cemetery 
which means that this isn't this is a graveyard right it's a valley that's used as a graveyard and it's a graveyard for kings which is why it's known as the valley of the kings and the corpse of king tut the mummy has just been removed from his tomb and as the mummy is being removed from the tomb there is an angry wind that is going on everywhere and because we're in the desert there are dust devils which means like little swirls of dust that are being um that are being um rushed up by the wind and the author describes it to us as ghostly dust devils ghostly because um well it's 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 think about the sand sort of swirling and swirling you know and it looks a little scary and it looks a little odd and unexplainable so all of that makes it a little bit ghostly and they're actually called dust devils those kinds of like um stormy dust patterns uh so that is what the first line gives us and dust devils is a uh, an alliteration dark bellied clouds had scudded across the desert sky all day and now were veiling the stars in casket gray scudded scudded means that the clouds are going very fast across the sky like they're being pushed by the wind and they're dark bellied which means they're probably storm clouds and they're very dark gray and so all throughout the day these are the kinds of clouds that have been going across the desert sky which means that the day has actually been quite dark also and now in the evening the clouds are still around which means that they're covering up the light of the stars they're veiling the stars in casket gray so they're making the stars also like they're covering the sky the stars up with this grayness um which means there is very little light in the evening also and casket gray why casket because um it's a reference to the fact that tut has just been removed from his coffin right from his resting place so casket is also a resting place a coffin uh, for a corpse and so it's casket gray uh it's a reference to the entire to the event that is happening right now which is removing king tut from his uh, resting place it was 6 pm on 5th january 2005 the date the time the world's most famous mummy king tut is the world's most famous mummy glided head first into a ct scanner brought here to probe the lingering medical mysteries of this little understood young ruler who died more than 3300 years ago so there's a ct scanner that's been brought to the tomb and they're putting king tut through the ct scanner and what they want what the objective of this experiment is to try to find out why he died that young um even though his death happened so 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 long ago and the author calls this a medical mystery which is to say they don't have a reason for why he died there's a mystery around it so medical mysteries again is an alliteration and what we're really getting here in this first paragraph is the author setting up the atmosphere right um we have these dark clouds we have these stormy dust devils we have the wind that's blowing really fast and it's described as angry he could have described it as loud and that would have been a descriptive term right he'd have been explaining what the wind is like but he calls it angry he gives the wind some personality there and it's deliberate personality he wants to set up this kind of eerie atmosphere to this entire scene he wants to kind of freak us out a little bit and make it seem as though nature is kind of reacting to what is happening to the fact that this corpse is being removed from the tomb so that's going on in this first para all afternoon the usual line of tourists from around the world had descended into the cramped rock cut tomb some 26 feet underground to pay their respects So this tomb is a very famous tourist spot, and even that very day, uh, that afternoon, people from all around the world had gone underground. It's it's a valley, as we said, uh, a valley of kings. So the tombs are underground, and um, so they go into the tomb and they pay their respects. Uh, 
it's it's a again it's an odd phrase to use here because generally you pay your respects to somebody who is very famous or very respectable or somebody like a king so in this case king tut if he was alive you would visit him to pay your respects to him and when someone dies you also go to pay your respects to them um to in front of their family also um so that kind of thing is being mentioned here they're just there to like see something that interests them right uh, but the author kind of puts this phrase in to to highlight the importance and the relevance of tut and to also remind us really that you know not only is this a famous dead king uh uh he, to remind us really that he is a famous dead king yeah they gazed at the murals on the walls of the burial chamber and peered at tut's gilded face the most striking feature of his mummy shaped outer coffin lid so in the space where tut is lying there are paintings all around the walls so they're looking at all of these paintings that's what murals are and then they look at his face but it's not actually his face um so in egypt what happened was that the coffin in which mummies were put used to be shaped like the mummy so the face of the person would be the top of the coffin lid and their body would be the rest of the top of the coffin lid um so that's the face that they're looking at the face on top of the coffin lid which is gilded because the coffin outer lid has been made out of metal probably gold because he's a king uh, and he is very famous king so they're looking at tut's gilded um made with metal face and that's the most striking part of the outer coffin lid some visitors read from guide books in a bus stop some of them have you know those kinds of tour books that you get when you're going on a tour and they're reading from them others stood silently perhaps pondering tuts untimely death in his sleep dreams maybe some of them were just standing around silently thinking about why he died so young uh, at such a at such a such an unex, uh, unexpected time and and such a sad time to die really uh, your late teens or wondering with a shiver if the pharaoh's curse death or misfortune falling upon those who disturbed him was really true so maybe some of these people who are standing there silently are thinking about this myth that exists about the pharaoh's curse and they're wondering if it's really true and what is this pharaoh's curse it's a curse where if somebody disturbs tut then something bad will happen to them right um that's a second para and you know this pharaoh's curse kind of explains this entire like the drama of this first paragraph right the author is trying to make us feel as though maybe the pharaoh's curse is happening um because misfortune and death fall upon those who disturb him and these people these scientists who are removing him from his tomb in order to put him in a ct scan are decisively disturbing him so that aura of like dark doom in the first paragraph is actually a subtle sort of reference to this pharaoh's curse um and this fear of the pharaoh's curse right um myths like this they kind of just grow around historical objects they grow around antique things that we don't know anything about and when there's any kind of a mystery about something some sort of theory grows up around it and when that theory grows up we kind of take it as like one of those things that we just it just becomes a myth a thing that's kind of spread around by word of mouth and everybody knows about it and it becomes like ingrained in 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 popular culture um there's actually like movies about the pharaoh's curse and stuff i think it's a very common like idea now just checking if you have any questions please ask me at this moment uh we'll keep going with the lesson otherwise uh 
and low to zero from the that's a motorbike i think okay the mummy is in very bad condition because of what carter did in the 1920s said zahi havas secretary general of egypt supreme council of antiquities as he leaned over the body for a long first look so somebody called zahi havas who is a doctor who is very very famous uh, especially well known for um, this discovery of tut and he even written a book about it if you want to watch that out uh so zahi havas is this this is council of antiquities in egypt it probably uh is in charge of taking care of all of these antique things and their discovery and how archaeologists handle them and things like that and he is the secretary general of this council and he is there that day and he is looking at the body uh and he leans over it for a long first look. so he spends a lot of time looking at it um and he says oh this mummy is in really bad condition and it's in really bad condition because of what someone called carter did in the 1920s and we'll find out what that is very soon carter howard carter that is was the british archaeologist who in 1922 discovered tut's tomb after years of futile searching so howard carter is the first person who has found tut's tomb and he found it in 1922 its contents though hastily ransacked in antiquity were surprisingly complete and most of the inside of the tomb was left intact some of it had been ransacked in antiquity which means that in olden times people had probably stolen from it ransacked means to have um, kind of taken all of the things from that place away and looting so people had looted it in olden times but other than that looting most of the tomb was totally fine and as it was when it was initially built they remain the richest royal collection ever found and have become part of the pharaoh's legend so tut's tomb is one of the most um well adorned tombs there's a lot of like jewels and gold so it's the richest collection that they found amongst all the other kings in the valley of kings and they've become part of the pharaoh's legend which probably means that they've gotten uh, associated with the name of tut also uh, that this this idea that he had this richest royal collection has been associated with tut um that's that's become part of his story and part of the things that people say about him a lot stunning artifacts in gold so beautiful things made of gold their eternal brilliance meant to guarantee resurrection um these golden things are still gleaming they're still bright and these golden things the author tells us are meant to ensure resurrection what is resurrection mean the reawakening of the body so the egyptians must have had a belief that gold and leaving gold with the pharaoh would uh, ensure that some day he would come back to life caused a sensation at the time of the discovery and still get the most attention so when people found out that there was so much gold in the tomb everyone was really really astounded and that's something that caught everybody's attention and even now even today it's one of the most interesting things about the tomb to a lot of people but tut was also buried with everyday things he'd want in the afterlife board games a bronze razor linen undergarments cases of food and wine and some of the other things that are in the tomb are usual things um like board games like a razor for shaving undergarments food wine and why was all of this buried in with tut um all of it was buried in with tut because the egyptians believed that um once you die and you go over into the afterlife the life after death uh 
all of the things that are left with you in your tomb are things that you can take with you. So they bury all of the things in the tomb with your uh, corpse. This is an old practice, as I said. Uh, they left gold and they left daily things for to, to use. I'm gonna check to see if you all have any questions. Yes, I do teach in English, Ashpreet. I don't, I don't teach in Hindi. Um, after months of carefully recording the pharaoh's funerary treasures, Carter began investigating his three nested coffins. So Carter finds this tomb in 1922, and the first thing that he does, he spends months sort of putting down and tracking down everything that's in the tomb. So all of these things that we just found out are in the tomb, all of these things. We owe it to Carter that we know these things because he's put down a record of them. And then after that, Carter looks at this, the three nested coffin, which means that there's a coffin within a coffin within a coffin and within that is this um, mummy. Opening the first, he found a shroud adorned with garlands of willow and olive leaves, wild celery, lotus petals, and cornflowers, the faded evidence of a burial in March or April. So when he opened the very first coffin, um, what he found was a shroud, which is a piece of cloth covering the dead usually. So here it's a piece of cloth and on it there are garlands of all of these different leaves and all of these different flowers and all of these different things. And those particular flowers and those particular leaves tell us at what point of time Tut was buried. Because flowers and leaves are a good way of seeing which part of the year they're in. Um, some things only bloom at certain times. So based on that, uh, they've estimated that Tut has probably been buried in March or in April. When he finally reached the mummy though, he ran into trouble. When he opens like the other two coffins and he sees the mummy, some trouble happens. The ritual resins had hardened, cementing to, cementing to, to the bottom of his solid gold coffin. So the entire coffin is made of gold. And Tut is stuck to the bottom of the coffin because of resins. Resins are sticky substances that you derive from certain natural things, trees generally. And ritual resins, this has to do with the practice of the ancient Egyptians again. What they did when somebody died was, first they covered the body in salt for I think this 70 days or something like that. Um, and they covered it in salt so that all the moisture in the body would dry up completely. And once the body was completely dry, they covered it, they wrapped it up, right, to make it into a mummy. And to wrap it up in linen, they used resin as this sticky kind of glue substance. So this is the ritual that we're being, uh, that is being referred to. So those ritual resins have hardened because glue like hardens. Um, and it's stuck to, it's not only stuck the linens to it, but it's also stuck to, to the bottom of his coffin. And so now the issue is that they can't move to it out of his coffin. No amount of legitimate, legitimate force could move them. Carter wrote later. What was to be done? So later Carter writes about this and Carter says, um, no amount of legitimate, which is accepted, authorized force could move them. And what could he do? And what did he do? We will see. <clears throat> so something that this, this paragraph gives us, a bunch of themes again, um, how previous archaeology expeditions have added to this like repertoire of knowledge, um, how people make records to keep track of things within their disciplines, how, how, how kind of archaeology works and the kind of work that archaeologists do with this entire like recording and this investigating and how this kind of small evidence gives you such a big conclusion, right? Uh, 
So we see kind of the process of the workings of the discipline of archaeology. And we get this very interesting thing about legitimate force, which means that there are procedures that are acceptable, right? Some certain set of authorized procedures, routine procedures that people are used to using. And here, all of those routine things that people usually carry out are not working. And so, the sun can beat down like a hammer this far south in Egypt. And Carter tried to use it to loosen the resins. For several hours, he set the mummy outside in blazing sunshine that heated it to 149 degrees Fahrenheit. Nothing budged. So, Egypt and the location that they're in in Egypt, the sun is incredibly hot. So hot that Carter hopes that it might uh, melt that hardness and loosen the body of Tut from the coffin. And so he puts the mummy outside the sun. And the sun heats the mummy up immensely, right? To 149 degrees Fahrenheit. But nothing happens to the presence. So Tut is still stuck to his coffin. He reported with scientific detachment that the consolidated material had to be chiseled away from beneath the tombs and trunk before it was possible to raise the king's remains. So Carter, as we know, is writing about the process of what happened uh, and he tells us, oh, no legitimate force worked. And so instead, he decides that what they're going to do is they're going to chip away at the resin. Um, so to chisel away, they're probably going to use instruments. The risk of damaging the mummy's body is very real, right? Um, and he has decided that this decision is going to be taken anyway, and that they're going to um, <clears throat> remove this resin by force, uh, and then raise the king's remains. Um, otherwise, it won't be possible to take Tut out from his tomb. And trunk here doesn't mean um, a tree trunk or, or or a suitcase trunk. It's the body of Tut that's being called the, the trunk. This is the trunk segment of the body. In his defense, Carter really had little choice. So this is the kind of decision that, you know, people are going to be shocked by. They're going to be like, you're wrecking an artifact of historical significance. Um, this is a terrible decision to make. But the author tells us that Carter didn't really have any other alternatives but to make this decision. If he hadn't cut the mummy free, thieves most certainly would have circumvented the guards and ripped it apart to remove the gold. So, actually let's read a little bit more and we'll see what this means. In Tut's time, the royals were fabulously wealthy and they thought or hoped they could take their riches with them. For his journey to the great beyond, King Tut was lavished with glittering goods, precious collars, inlaid necklaces and bracelets, rings, amulets, a ceremonial apron, sandals, sheaths for his fingers and toes, and the now iconic inner coffin and mask, all of pure gold. So here we get a bunch of information. Um, Again. Hello to whoever's joined us. We're doing discovering to today. Okay, so what we get so far from this paragraph is that um, A. In those ancient times, when Tut was alive, the royals were very, very wealthy. Um, B, the royals had this belief that if they were buried with their riches, then they could take those riches with them into the afterlife. So they would often end up being buried with their gold, right? And King Tut too has been buried similarly with his gold. And for his journey to the great beyond, to the great afterlife. Um, the great beyond is like this phrase that people use to refer to death in general, death and after. King Tut was lavished, so he has been sort of lavishly decorated with a lot of jewelry, 
He has collars, he has necklaces, bracelets, rings, amulets, um, which are generally for protection, um, a ceremonial apron, um, sandals, sheets, which are coverings for his fingers and toes, and, the, and a mask of gold and an inner coffin made of gold. And all of it is made of gold. And all of this is something has been put onto it and then it has been wrapped up, right, uh, mummified. Um, and Carter worries back in 1922 when they've just found the tomb that if they don't pull the mummy out from the, from the, the, the coffin and remove all of this gold, then the thieves who, you know, would benefit a lot from accessing this gold would somehow have circumvented, which means gone past or gotten past the guards um, so they have a guarding system for this, uh, this tomb, but it's possible that thieves would have still gotten past the guards and torn the mummy apart in order to remove the gold, right? In order to thieve all of that gold. Um, and so because of this fear of thieves and the fear that the mummy would be even more destroyed, uh, and so destroyed that they probably have nothing of it left, Carter makes this hasty decision, uh, to separate Tut from his adornments. Carter's men removed the mummy's head and severed nearly every major joint. So what they do is they cut the mummy apart, they remove the head, they pull apart all the joints and they take all of the gold off of Tut. And once they had finished, they reassemble the remains on a layer of sand in a wooden box with padding that conceal the damage, the bed where Tut now rests. And once they're done removing all of the gold, which means that now nobody's going to find the mummy something that they want to come and, you know, rip apart to find any gold in. There's no gold left. And so they put the remains back together in a wooden box. They cover the box with a layer of sand and they put the remains on that sand. And they put like padding, um, probably of linen. Uh, so it's like, you know, in your teddy bear, if there's like, there's padding inside the teddy bear, that cottony stuff. Um, and if you, you know, make like a hole in the teddy bear and you pull out some of the padding, it'll seem obvious that there's a gap there. And so you put in more padding in order to make it seem less obvious that there's a gap there. So similarly, to make all of those cuts look like they're not really there, they put in like extra padding, probably of linen again, to hide the damage. And this is where Tut now lies. Um, this is the current tomb. Uh, current setup for Tut. And one thing that we get here is this phrase of scientific detachment. And what does that mean? Um, scientific detachment means you sound like you don't, you kind of remove yourself from the circumstances. You look at it, you look at what needs to be done and you kind of do that right um and here what's happening is that it may be a tragedy to like have to tear apart this mummy in this harsh way but even though it's a tragedy it's something that has to be done and so it will be done and that's the kind of scientific detachment quality that we're getting here this kind of removal of yourself from the situation and not letting yourself be affected by the the fact that this is a tragedy because you really do have no sort of choice here. Archaeology has changed substantially in the intervening decades, focusing less on treasure and more on the fascinating details of life and intriguing mysteries of death. So the author tells us that while back in those times, archaeology was also something that was very focused on treasure like this, like this gold. Um, now it focuses less on that kind of treasure and focuses instead on different things like how were these people's lives and what were their deaths like what happened when they died um what caused them to die so the details of life and the mysteries of death are kind of what archaeology focuses on now and the intervening decades, the decades between 1922 and the present day, where they are all currently gathered in the tomb to carry out this CT scan. 
also mysteries of death is a phrase that the author uses because death is like a mystery to everyone right um and in the case of archaeology they're looking into how these people died but it's also uh, so the mystery of those specific people's deaths and finding out how they died to which there can be an answer that can be found if there's enough evidence lying around but it's also a uh, a tip a reference to the sort of fact that there is a general mystery um to death for all of us and we don't know anything about death um it also uses more sophisticated tools including medical technology so archaeology is not only changed in terms of what the discipline thinks about but also how the discipline works it now has a lot more fancy advanced tools including medical technology like the ct scan in 1968 more than 40 years after carter's discovery an anatomy professor extracted the mummy and revealed a startling fact beneath the resin that cakes his chest his breastbone and front ribs are missing so when the x-ray became a thing that was used very commonly when it was invented and um 40 years later after like carter's like discovery of the tomb somebody used the x-ray on the mummy and they found out that beneath all of that gluey substance on his chest tooth's breastbone and front ribs are missing so an entire set of like bones are missing from tooth there's no explanation that like the author gives us for this um but one of the things that happened with ancient egypt was that people used to remove the internal organs of um dead bodies and put them in like separate caskets and put them around in places in the tomb or maybe this had something to do with how to die we can't tell <clears throat> but yeah this developed technology basically gives them access to information that they didn't have before today diagnostic imaging can be done with computed tomography or ct by which hundreds of x-rays in cross section are put together like slices of bread to create a three dimensional virtual body <coughs> so today um we've gone farther than the x ray also we've gone as far as the ct scan and the full form of ct is computed tomography and this is something that you know if you if your parents get regular checkups with the doctors or you you've gone for a checkup with the doctor regularly then you know that a ct scan is a thing that the doctor recommends that you do when they want to get a better idea of what your uh, what the inside of your body looks like what sort of state state it's in um and the ct is more detailed than the x ray it gives you information also about all the tissues in your body and not just the bones um and so here uh the author is kind of trying to explain to us what a ct is and how it compares to an x-ray and a ct is basically like lots of x-rays that are kind of put together and they give us a more three dimensional view of like all these different parts of the body <clears throat> so what more could a ct scan reveal of tut than the x-ray So presumably a CT scan is going to tell us more about it than the X-ray, but what is it going to tell us? That's the question. And could it answer two of the biggest questions still lingering about him? How did he die, and how old was he at the time of his death? And is it possible that this new technology will finally answer two of these questions that people have always asked about it, which is how did this person die, and how old was he actually when he died? So what we get in this paragraph is um how advanced technology gives us the opportunity to learn more and to expand existing knowledge of many disciplines that already exist in here for instance archaeology also it's i mean it's it's advanced technology in the field of medicine but it's kind of gone into the other discipline of archaeology and it's helping archaeology also find out more so across disciplines it's expanding knowledge advanced technology and so it sort of emphasizes the 
possibility and the potential of advanced technology. <clears throat> King Tut's demise was a big event even by royal standards. He was the last of his family's line and his funeral was the death rattle of a dynasty. But the particulars of his passing away and its aftermath are unclear. So the fact that King Tut died was a very, very big deal back then. And it's such a big deal that it's a big deal even in comparison to the deaths of other kings, um, which was already a pretty big deal. So it's a massive deal, King Tut's death. Um, and why is it such a massive deal? It's because he was the very last of a specific dynasty of emperors and he had no heirs, he was very young still. And when he died, it wasn't marking only his death, it was marking the death rattle um, of a dynasty, of an entire like, of an entire set of uh, people who had ruled from this particular family line. So it marks the end of a particular era in, uh, in ancient Egypt. And a death rattle is, is the sound of the breath of someone who is dying, the sort of struggle to like breathe and breathe out sounds like rattling so that's the that's what death rattle means um <clears throat> that's what it refers to sort of shaking sound but but we still have no information about how he died and what happened after he died but we do have information about before and that's what we're going to read about here amenhotep the third to its father or grandfather was a powerful pharaoh who ruled for almost four decades at the height of the 18th dynasty's golden age. His son, Amenhotep IV, succeeded him and initiated one of the strangest periods in the history of ancient Egypt. So Tut's father or grandfather, we don't know how he is related to Amen, uh, Amenhotep III, but Amenhotep III was this really great king and he ruled for 40 years and it's the golden age of the dynasty which means that it's the best of times um, for that dynasty. It's it's a great time. And then immediately after that comes Amenhotep IV. And Amenhotep IV starts instead of this instead of continuing this golden age, he kicks the, he kicks off this very odd period. And what happens in this odd period and what makes it odd? <clears throat> The new pharaoh promoted the worship of the Aten, the sun disk, changed his name to Akhenaten, or servant of the Aten, and moved the religious capital from the old city of Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, now known, known now as Amarna. <coughs> so, the king um, promotes the worship of the sun, the sun which is known as the Aten, he changes his name to say that he is a servant of the Aten and he moves the religious capital from a place that they used to have it at, which is Thebes, to a place that is newly created and named after the sun disk, which he is saying that they should all worship, right? Um, so basically, he's brought in a new kind of direction to religion. He's changed religion as it exists and he's done it in these three ways new god changed his name to reflect the name of that god and moved the capital to a city religious capital to a city that is named after that new god also and akhetaten is now known as amarna in in the present day he further shocked the country by attacking amun a major god smashing his images and closing his temples not only did he bring up this new god he decided to attack part of the old religion and he attacks this really major god, um, kind of destroys all of his idols and closes all of his temples. And this is the strange period, right? Um, it's a very destructive period because something that people have been used to for so long and something that's been a big part of their lives, this entire religious setup has been turned upside down by Amenhotep IV and new religion, new religious focus has been brought in. And that's very shocking to everyone. It must have been a horrific time, said Ray Johnson, director of the University of Chicago's research center in Luxor, the site of ancient Thebes. Luxor is where Thebes, which is the old um, religious capital, um, used to be. So, present day, 
it's called Laksa and University of Chicago has a research center there and the director of that research center is Jay Johnson and he's talking about this particular period of history to the author and he says you know this change must have been really terrible for all of the people of that time the family that had ruled for centuries was coming to an end and then Akhenaten went a little wacky. So not only has this dynasty which has been ruling for so many years seemed to be slowing down and coming to an end, the one of the very last people who is part of this dynasty has also seemed to kind of go crazy, right? Um, doing all of these things that they don't find acceptable at all. And so we take a little trip into history and we get some insight. <clears throat> we get some insight into royal life, we get some insight into the specific dynasty, and we get some insight into how a political a particular political decision can kind of overturn life as the people know it. And here it's a religious decision that's been taken, and it's really shocked the people. And we also get some insight from a scholar, from someone who's been working on this a lot. So this article really picks up information from all sorts of different places and brings it together for us to read. <clears throat> After Akhenaten's death, a mysterious ruler named Smenkare appeared briefly and exited with hardly a trace. Akhenaten dies. Egypt is probably very grateful because, I mean, He's really messed things up for their way of life. And then some other mysterious ruler comes up and is only around very briefly. And there's very little left of him, so we know very little about him. And then a very young Tutankhaten took the throne. <coughs> King Tut, as he is widely known today. So when he was a boy, King Tut used to be called Tutankhaten. And that's probably the Aten part of the name that like uh, Aten has forced everybody to take, which refers to the sun disk of the god, probably people in the family. And um, <clears throat> the boy king soon changed his name to Tutankhamun, living image of Amun, and oversaw a restoration of the old ways. He reigned for about nine years and then died unexpectedly. So King Tut comes to power, and as soon as he comes to power, he changes his name. Rather than it referring to the sun god, it now refers to Amun, who is the god that Akhenaten was destroying. And he makes himself the living image of Amun, a sort of incarnation of Amun. And he goes ahead and makes sure that people start respecting Amun again. And all of those changes that Akhenaten made, he undoes those changes and brings back the old way of living. And then he reigns for like nine years, and then he dies unexpectedly. And so Tutankhamun means a lot to the people probably because he's brought back that sense of comfort that they had with their own style of life. He's brought back that reassurance after, you know, a bunch of years of instability with Akhenaten. Um, and it's also a very, very, very clever tactic by Tutankhamun. Um, because think about it, if you're coming to power after somebody has been really terrible and really wrecked how people have been living so far, then giving the people something that they have been missing for all this time, giving it back to them, it's a good way of ensuring that people will look at you and respect you and support you. So politically, a very good tactic. Regardless of his fame and the speculations about his fate, Tut is one mummy among many in Egypt. How many? No one knows. The Egyptian mummy project, which began an inventory in late 2003, has recorded almost 600 so far and is still counting. Although Tut is very famous as a king and there's a lot of curiosity about Tut in particular, Tut is just one of a lot of mummies in Egypt. We actually don't even know how many mummies there are so far. There's a project called the Egyptian Mummy Project that's been counting them. Um, it began an inventory, uh, a, a track list of mummies, and it's recorded 600 mummies and there are still more to count. Uh, maybe over by now. So that's something to go check out. The next phase, scanning the mummies at the portable CT machine donated by the National Geographic Society and Siemens, its manufacturer. 
So they're counting the mummies and the next thing they're going to do is they're going to scan the mummies with a CT machine. It's a portable machine which means it can just be moved from here to there and the mummies don't need to be moved that far. And it's been donated by the National Geographic Society. Um, and the article about all of this is in the National Geographic magazine. So uh, Siemens is the manufacturer of the CT machine so they've also come in and donated. <coughs> King Tut is one of the first mummies to be scanned and one of the first mummies that can scan is this one, King Tut. In death as in life, moving regally ahead of his countrymen. What a phrase. Um, in death as in life, moving regally ahead of his countrymen. In life, King Tut was the king. So, of course, he was at the first of his nation. He was, um, think about like a big crowd and the crowd would like part ways for the king to go first, right? The king is the foremost, uh, foremost priority of that society. So King Tut is at the top of the country, the most important person. So he's always at the front, moving regally ahead, regally, stately, um, with dignity and royalty. Um, so he is, he is always at the first, the beginning. And just like he was like that in life because of being a king, in death too, um, he is the first to be scanned. He is the first mummy to be scanned. So in death also, all of the other mummies will be following him and he is at the very front of the crowd. So that kind of um, is what this line means. Checking the chat again. Hello to Mohit and Updesh and Chanjit. Um, I'm good, Chanjit. How are you? Um, we've covered almost all of the lesson. We are gonna finish off just the next couple of chapters. We sh I mean, next next couple of paragraphs. We should be done in like ten minutes or so. If you have any questions, drop them in the chat. My throat is dying, so I'm gonna get some water again, and then I'll look at the chat. CT machines scan the mummy head to toe, creating 1,700 digital X-ray images in cross section. <coughs> Tut's head scanned in 0.62 millimeter slices to register its intricate structures takes on in eerie detail in the resulting image. <coughs> so the mummy is put through the CT machine, and the CT machine scans the mummy from the top to the bottom, and it creates. 1,700 x-ray images in cross-section in like detail um, and Tut's head so the CT machine apparently can scan in certain like they, you can set how many slices it's supposed to scan in like what sort of distance each x-ray is supposed to cover so that uh, and in with, when they're scanning Tut's head they scan it with 0.62 as the, the distance and so every little part of the head is being scanned from all angles, right? So an X-ray, a set of X-ray images of like, like very little segment of the head and another very little segment of the head, another very little segment of the head, so that all of the details that are there can be scanned. And when all of that scanning is done, they can see the head in the resulting image. And it has a lot of detail because they wanted it to take on a lot of detail and the narrator calls it eerie detail creepy detail um and it is a little eerie because it's a little odd to see the the head of somebody who died 3300 years ago who is wrapped in um, all of this linen and resin and then suddenly you can see that head being reconstructed in such detail it's shocking it's a little weird it's a little crazy that it's something that's even possible, right? And there's an eeriness in the fact that it's possible. So the narrator calls it eerie. With Tut's entire body is similarly recorded, and they do this to the entire rest of the body. It must take a lot of time. Um, <clears throat> but then when it's done, a team of specialists in radiology, forensics, and anatomy began to probe the secrets. So a team of 
specialists, people who've worked with radiology, um, people who've worked in forensics, um, and people who've worked with anatomy, so those who are familiar with the way the body is set up, those who are familiar with um, forensics is sort of it's forensic science is when you know something you're trying to trace out all of the things from the past um, so forensics um, radiology because this is a CD machine and <coughs> it uses radiology um, so all of these specialists come together and they try to unravel what the image means the secrets that the winged goddesses of a gilded burial shrine protected for so long. What does this mean? Um, so in the shrine, um, where the coffin is kept, the shrine being the tomb, um, and gilded meaning gold, uh, metal, um, covered uh, burial place. <coughs> There are also murals, right? There are paintings all around, and also there are probably decorations on the coffin itself. And there are winged goddesses that have been maybe painted somewhere, or maybe they're actually on the coffin. Um, but yeah, these images are there uh, on the coffin and or around the tomb. And the author says that they've um, they've been hiding the secrets of Tut. Um, all the author really means here is that, you know, until now it's not been possible for us to find out more. And these have been the top coverings of Tut, like these have been what we've seen from the outside, these winged goddesses, these depictions of winged goddesses. But the way that sentence is phrased is really nice. It's, um, it's kind of deliberate, right? The author makes it sound mythical and sort of mysterious and it makes it seem almost as though like, the gods themselves have been deliberately trying to hide all of the rumors around Tut and trying to safeguard um, this mystery of Tut for all this time. And a CT machine has unlocked it. <clears throat> the night of the scan, workmen called Tut from carried Tut from the tomb in his box. Like pallbearers, they climbed a ramp and a flight of stairs into the swirling sand outside then rose on a hydraulic lift into the trailer that held the scanner. So when the scan is going to happen, people carry tot from the tomb up above. And like pallbearers, pallbearers are people who carry um, the stretcher kind of thing that um, you lift onto you with the corpse on it. So four people carry like a, a corpse or a stretcher kind of thing. And those people are called pallbearers. And so these workmen are playing that kind of role. They're carrying Tut up in his box. Four people, like one, one, one each at like the corners of that box. Um, and they climb up the ramp and they get up the stairs and they get into the, 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 the trailer. The, the trailer is a vehicle that has the CT scanner in it. And we're told also that there's swirling sand outside still, those dusty storm devils that we heard about. So it's still very windy outside. 20 minutes later, two men emerged, sprinted for an office nearby, and returned with a pair of white plastic fans. The million dollar scanner had quit because of sand in a cooler fan. So 20 minutes after the corpse has gone inside, Two people like run for an office that's nearby and they come back with some plastic fans because um, this the CD scanner stops working in the middle of scanning Tut because there's some sand that's gotten into a fan. And the author says the million dollar scanner, which is to say it's a very precious scanner, it's very um, worthwhile and it had suddenly just stopped. And that's a very terrifying moment, right? When a piece of equipment that is so important and so expensive just stops um curse of the pharaoh joked to guard nervously and the pharaoh's like oh it's just it's it's Tutankhamun cursing us because if anybody disturbs the pharaoh then they're going to be cursed and we've been cursed by the the, the machine stopping working <clears throat> and he jokes it nervously 
And why does he do it nervously? It's a completely explainable incident, right? The fans quit because the sand got into them and the wind has been really bad that day. So the sand getting into the equipment makes sense. But it's still sudden and it's very unexpected because it's, it's a very expensive piece of equipment, very well-made, sophisticated piece of equipment. And the fact that there's this myth that's going on around King Tut means that when something odd happens, they're immediately like, oh no, what if it's the myth coming to life? And that's why it's a nervous joke. Um, there's kind of an underlayer of fear. What if it's real? And also kind of, thank God it's not real and that's the only reason we can joke about it. Hello to Kushali. Um, class tell timings are three to four, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. Eventually, the substitute fans worked well enough to finish the procedure. After checking that no data had been lost, the technicians turned it over to the workman who carried him back to his stool. Less than three hours after he was removed from his coffin, the pharaoh again rested in peace where the funerary priests had laid him so long ago. So the substitute fans that they brought in kickstart the procedure again and no data has been lost and once they find out that all is well, they kind of gift it back to the workman and the workman put him back in the tomb and all of this takes place in three hours within three hours the pharaoh is once again resting in his burial sh uh, shrine where he's been put years and years ago <coughs> back in the trailer a technician pulled up astonishing images of tut on a computer screen a gray head took shape from a scattering of pixels and the technician spun and tilted it in every direction. Neck vertebrae appeared as clearly as in an anatomy class. Other images revealed a hand, several views of the rib cage, and a transection of the skull. <clears throat> so in the trailer, they check on the results of the CT scan that they just performed, and they pull up like these brilliant, clear images of the king. Um, there's a head that takes shape in front of them, and the technician kind of moves it around and moves it in every direction to take a good look at all parts of it. They see all the vertebrae, the bones, the neck, as clearly as you can see it in, in a class where you're studying the anatomy of, um, of the body. Um, you, they look at images of the hand, images of the rib cage, of the uh, cut, up, cut up skull. Uh, <clears throat> but for now, the pressure was off. And so they know that everything's been successful and so there is no more immediate pressure now. Their um, technique, their procedure has gone well. Sitting back in his chair, Zahi Havas smiled, visibly relieved that nothing had gone seriously wrong. I didn't sleep last night, not for a second, he said. I was so worried. But now I think I will go and sleep. So Zahiyavas like finally sits back in his chair, which means he's finally relaxed. Instead of like sitting forward and like eagerly watching something happen, he sits back, relaxed, and he's really finally relaxed because nothing has gone wrong. The procedure has even gone well. And he says, oh, you know, I couldn't even sleep last night because I was that worried about what was going to happen today. But you know what? Now that it's over, I'm going to go sleep. Um, the kind of panic that we all have when something important is going to happen in our lives. Um, and that's what Zahiya was his feeling. And he is the supervisor, right? He's the secretary general. So the fact that they're trying this entirely new procedure on the mummy, and if they wrecked the mummy or something bad had happened to the mummy, then it would have been really terrible for them and their reputation and for the mummy also, which would be probably not in very good shape again. Um, so the kind of immense pressure also of trying something new, something that hasn't been tried before, all of that is there in the past paragraph that we just read. By the time we left the trailer, descending metal stairs, the sandy ground, the wind had stopped. The winter air lay cold and still like death itself in this valley of the departed. So all of these people leave the trailer together and they go into the sands and the wind that's been running from the first opening paragraph of this article has stopped. The winter air is still like death um, in this valley of the departed. 
just multiple references to the de to death that the author is making to remind us that you know we just looked at the corpse of somebody who has passed away. Just above the entrance to Tut's tomb stood Orion. So on top of the tomb of Tut, they could see a constellation, the constellation of Orion, the hunter. The constellation that the ancient Egyptians knew as the soul of Osiris, the god of the afterlife. And this constellation is something that back then Egyptians used to think about it as the soul of Osiris who is their god of the afterlife. And Orion is watching over the boy king. So in this moment it seems as though Osiris, the god of the afterlife, is watching over the dead king. And that's how this lesson ends, this article ends. Um, and in this paragraph, the atmosphere calms down, right? That raging wind calms down. Everything is finally still again. And it's still after King Tut has been put back where he belongs in his tomb. Um, and the story ends by referring to another god, right? To Osiris. Um, seeming as though, you know, this, it's, it's, it's a kind of magical, fantastical ending. Um, and we'll talk about why the author does this a little later. Uh, but for now, let's talk about some key themes and then we'll end class. A um, bunch of things that we found out in this is about history, history, not history, sorry about that, history and archaeology. Um, and we also get like some behind the scenes looks at how all of the information in such disciplines comes to be. So you know all of that history that you're reading in your textbooks, a lot of effort has been put into finding out what all of that is, right? We read it kind of like as, oh this fact and that fact and that fact and this fact and this is all what happened and this is kind of the how of the way that all of that information comes to be. So we get a look at how these disciplines work. We also get a look at the pressure that is there in such disciplines as there is pressure in every discipline um, and the mistakes that do happen as with the example of Carter. We got some insight on politics and history. Um, we talked a little bit about Tut. We talked a little bit about his very clever strategy in which he gets people to sort of love him using by, by simply changing his name and bringing back an old order that you know they really wanted back. We can't really tell if he did that deliberately or not, but it's a it's a good lesson on how politics can be a lot about strategy. Um, and another thing is the writing of this piece, right? Um, in it, we are in the present where they're using the CD scanner. We go into the recent past where Carter has just discovered the tomb. And then we go into the more distant historical ancient past where Tut was alive and all of the history of that. So this writing has spanned across multiple, multiple points of time. And it has also given us multiple sort of sensations. Um, we talked about science, the CT scanner, archaeology, all of those things, all of these modern day things. And we also talked a lot about mythological things, right? Um, all these references to Osiris, these so this atmosphere building of the wind being wild outside and then calming down when Tutor's being laid back, the curse that's talked about, the gilded winged goddesses that are protecting the secrets of Tut, all of this kind of, it has this impact where we seem to be drawn back a little bit into ancient Egypt where they really did believe all of these things are true. So that sort of magical feeling, that sort of fantastical feeling is brought across by this piece. So this piece does a very, very good job in sort of putting us in the modern day moment where the CD scan is happening and also giving us a sense of that sort of era in which people really believed in religion, in this particular religion and the way the religion worked and the sort of um, power of, of things that we would distinctly call unscientific like the Pharaoh's curse. But we see how even that makes an entry into a moment that is all about science. The CD scanner stops working and everybody's like, oh my god, is it, is it the Pharaoh's curse? And they're a little nervous, they're like, maybe it's really true. So how these moments of superstition and these moments of wondering if maybe this theory that is unlikely to be true could be true, 
also happens to us because we're human beings and we have a lot of feelings, a lot of complicated feelings and <clears throat> yeah, so a mix of science and a mix of that mythical feeling. So both of that comes across in this writing. It balances it really nicely. And one last question, and this is a question for you to think about. Uh, and let me know what you think about this. Why do we care about these things? Why do we care about Tut? Why do we want to know things about Tut? Why do we care about history? Right? It's a big question. And I will leave you to think about it. Let me know in the comments. Uh, let me know in the live chat. That brings us to the end of our lesson. And around, I'd just like you to stay for a couple more minutes to talk about Unacademy Plus. Um, Unacademy Plus has a lot of really cool features. If you liked today's content, for instance, and you'd like access to more such content like this, then you should go ahead and subscribe to Unacademy Plus. Um, you'll get access to a lot of sessions. You'll get access to a lot of study material, to a lot of practice tests to live tests also and doubt clearing sessions. These are the prices and the per month costs differ based on what duration you take up the subscription for and um, 1042 per month is how, how much a 24 month subscription would cost, which is less than say a six month subscription would cost. So that's something for you to note. There's also something called Unacademy Iconic that I want to tell you about, in which you get more personalized attention from educators. You get like um, individual support from them. You get reports on how you're doing. Your parents get reviews of how you're doing. You get access again to a lot of study material, and you get you get free range of everything that Unacademy has to offer, basically. Um, and again, these are the prices, and again, as you can see, the per month cost kind of goes down the longer the duration that you take it for. And there is a thing called a referral code that you can use um, in this like little segment, or when you download the Unacademy app, say you can put in a referral code, and it gives you 10% off on these things. Um, and mine is THAR01. Uh, all of that said, thank you for being here with me today. I hope you liked today's class. If you did, then do hit like. Leave me a comment if you have any feedback or you have any questions. Um, and do hit subscribe for more content like this. I will see you again.